Hi everyone, welcome to another Broken Meeple Top 10. It's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, sorry about that. I had something called the Top 100 to get through. But thank you so much for everybody who watched that Top 100. I had lots of views, lots of kind feedback, you know, lots of just general good discussion about the Top 100 in general. I enjoy doing it. You can guarantee there'll be one next year. We'll just see what format I want to choose. But, like I say, we got to get back to Top 10s now. And I've promised you, you know, some fairly good Top 10s in the future. For starters, you know, I've got to also do top 10 games I've spent too much money on but still like. And I've been going through this little black book you know, recently and just writing down a lot of top 10 lists in general. Some based on your feedback, thank you very much for giving me ideas, you know, keep putting them in the comments, I'd like to hear more top 10 ideas. Uh, watching Dice Tower to see what top 10s they've done, I'd like to go, hmm, you know what, that'd be an interesting list. And just weird ideas that I've had. So, what have I written in here? Top 10 stressful games, top 10 ugly games that I still like, uh, top 10 games most improved by expansions, uh, top 10 worker placement games, because it's a very popular genre, and is there another one in here? No, no, that, that's the main ones that I've been working on, and there are some ones back in this book where I've been like, yeah, I've kind of skipped over them, like insane components, didn't really feel like that one too much, uh, and various other little ones that are just like, no big deal. And at the end of the year, obviously, I'll be doing my top 10 of 2018, and also by request, I will also do a top 10 of 2008. I'm going to do a top, I'm going to do like a 10-year a retrospective list. The retrospective lists I did back to 2013 were quite popular, so I want to do like, you know, 2018, and then look back at 2008. And then when 2019 comes, I'll look back at 2009, and so on. It will take me a fair while before I catch up to 2013 again. But that's for the future. What have I got in this book for today? Top 10 solo games. If anything has been requested by a lot of people, it's top 10 solo games. I'm only too happy to oblige, because I love solo gaming. There's a lot of people out there that seem to poo-poo on solo gaming. And, you know, like, oh, come on, I only want to play with other people. Why would I want to be a loner by myself in a little cave playing games? I can understand that to an extent. I love playing games with other people. I mean, let's face it, a lot of games, you know, I'll pull this off the shelf and I want to play it with other people. Not every game can be played solo and at the end of the day, interacting with other people, new people, friends, family, whatever, is one of the best things that board games allows us to do. But solo gaming does help. Sometimes I just, you know, I live alone. I don't have a girlfriend right now, I don't live with my family, they're back in Somerset. So sometimes I'm just by myself and I fancy playing a game. I'll whip out a solo game and have some fun. And also, solo gaming is a way to learn the rules of a game pretty well. Yeah, granted, some of them tweak the rules in terms of what mode and variants they use, but for the most part, you can get the basics of a game down pretty well by undertaking the solo mode, or a solo playthrough. Now, this was a hard list to make. I mean, I nearly needed a second page for writing down, you know, a short list, and it was so hard coming up with 10, I and mean, it was even harder trying to rank those 10. I could have made this a top 20 list, and I don't know. Maybe I'll do an 11 to 20 if you ask really nicely, but you know, I've got to think about the time on my hands. But at the moment, I have done my top 10 solo games. So without further ado, let's uh, you know, exit my little dark cave of loneliness and actually talk about some great games. Now the caveat with this list is that these are not just simply my top 10 favourite games that are, happen to have a solo mode, no, no, no. These are specifically 10 games that I enjoy playing solo more than the multiplayer variants. Because there's a lot of games that I love to bits and they happen to have a solo mode, but I prefer to play the game multiplayer rather than solo. And I'm also not including digital app plays. So just because there happens to be an app that's really good playing solo on the app, that does not count, okay? So I'm not including solo app plays. This is gonna be physical board games and mainly just which ones do I prefer to play by myself rather than with other people. Not to say that I don't wanna play with other people, but there's just a preference thing. So my number 10 is a pretty meaty Euro, actually. I still enjoy playing this with other players, but when you get to the four player mark, this is quite a lengthy game, particularly as you're taking actions out of turn sometimes, and depending on how you've been uh, you know, judging your actions and your turns, you might get left out of that. But this has a really good solo mode for a meaty Euro game. 
It's one of Vital Lacerda's games, and they've been hit and miss in terms of solo modes, I find. I mean, one in particular, uh, Vinyos, I wasn't a fan of the solo mode in that one. It was just way too punishing. This one, though, allows you to do some really crafty things with planning what the opponent AI is going to do and how you should react to it. You play it very differently, in a sense, to how you would normally play the Gallerist against multiplayer opponents. And I just gave it away, didn't I? Yeah, number 10, the Gallerist. This huge monstrosity back here. Whoop, out we come. Yes. I really like the solo mode in this. Essentially what happens is uh, Lacerda, the AI, um, moves around the board in a kind of set fashion. But you can kick him out and as you do, he does certain things and it accelerates the game timer. So what you are trying to do is you are trying to go on spaces, obviously to build up your art gallery and sell art and do all that stuff that you normally do, but you want the Serda to kick you out as much as possible so you get as many actions as you can before the game timer ends. The thing is, you don't want to kick him out of too many actions because it accelerates the game to a point. So it's a weird sort of tug and you know tug of war match between you and the AI in trying to maximize the amount of actions and the efficiency of those actions as possible before the game timer ends. It's not easy, I can tell you that. I mean the the, the apprentice level stuff that you do is like Seriously? Half the time I don't get that sort of thing in a normal game against multiplayer and I'm supposed to be just the apprentice in solo mode? So suffice to say I'm not an expert at this by any means. But it's a fun way to play the game and it's certainly a very good way to learn the rules because apart from a few tweaks for the AI, you're pretty much doing exactly what you did before. Discovering artists, you're promoting them, you're going to the international market, you're selling art, you're doing 90% of the things you do in the normal game just with a couple of twists thrown in. So it's a good learning tool, and with this one, this is the best written rule book out of all the Surger's games, by far. So it's not even a difficult solo mode to get into. It's a solid one, probably the meatiest uh, solo mode I have on here. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say this is the heaviest game on this list. And like I say, for a heavy game as this, to have a solo mode I want to play, that's pretty good high praise. So number 10, The Gallerist. <laughs> And number nine is a true solo game. And I think there's gonna be, yeah, there's gonna be two of these on this list. You know, games that can only be played solo. This is one of them. It's a dice game with a little bit of a controversial theme, but you know, if you just get into the game and just have fun with it, it's not that, you know, nasty a theme. It's not something that you couldn't say, get some like teenagers to play or something like that. It kind of depends how you view the whole sort of uh, terrorism and you know uh, style of act. It's obviously, if you take it very seriously, then this might put you off, you know, a little warning there. But if you're just gonna get into it and accept it's only a game at the end of the day, then this one, Hostage Negotiator, is a solid solo game to play. There's a lot of luck in it. Yes, you're rolling dice. Basically, you have a scenario where a certain type of adversary, and it could be just your typical gun-ho, yes, I've got hostages, give me lots of money, or it could be uh, a, you know, a, a traumatic you know, father trying to get medical bills for his daughter, could be a cult, could be a CEO boss who's just flipped and lost his lid after a deal's gone bust or something. There's all sorts of these different scenarios. They've taken a certain amount of hostages, and what you're doing is you're rolling dice in order to have conversations with the abductor. And the better you roll on certain cards, the more positive the effects, but if you roll badly, they can have negative effects. So essentially, you're doing what you see in some of those movies. I mean, what was... Um it's one of my favourite ones, a phone, is it called Phone Booth? I can't remember. The guy's like in a phone booth throughout the entire movie talking to a hostage negotiator. It's, like, it's quite a cool film. And there's some other films in that sort of regard. I like hostage negotiations in films because they're always really tense, you know, if they're acted well, that is. And um, with these, you, these cards allow you to either sort of decrease the threat level of the villain. So it's kind of like, uh, all right, maybe I don't want to do this. Fine, you can have a hostage, you know, that's fine but you roll badly or if things go wrong and there are event decks where if you take too long it will eventually get bad. The guy starts getting really worked up and it's like, like don't, don't push me, don't push me, poof! You know, takes out a hostage or, you know, demands more stuff. You know, I don't want the money, I now want a helicopter and a villa in Barbados, I don't know. But a <laughs> strange request, I suppose. But it's a, it's a very, for a dice game, it's wonderfully thematic in how the scenario plays out if you just immerse yourself in the theme. There's a lot of luck, yes, it's a dice game, but it's a short game. 
doesn't take too long to set up the scenario. You play it, you roll some dice, mix around some cards. You're trying to be efficient with the cards, so it's not just simply grab whatever cards you can. You want the cards that suit your particular strategic path. And of course, you know, the events and the various terror cards can throw a bit of a spanner in the works. This is Crime Wave, which is a standalone uh, version of it. You can get the original version as well, I think, somewhere. But this is the newest one that has a box that stores everything. There's little booster packs for additional abductors and different scenarios. I've got all of them. I think I've got everything there is for this game in this one box. And hopefully they're still releasing more content because I haven't played everything in this box, but eventually I will. And soon it's like, come on, give me more abductors. Give me some more ideas. So Hostage Negotiator, if you don't mind the theme, it's a solid dice game to get into. Now my number 8 is a bit of a cheat. Yeah, I know, sorry, sorry, there's two games on this number 8, but when I was thinking about them I just thought, these games are so similar, they give me the same sort of feel, but with a different setting, a different context, I just couldn't really split them apart and have them separate items on the same list. Especially when, when I consider which one I like better than the other, it's a very tight margin between them. These are from Portal Games and they represent some incredibly thematic survival games. And when it comes to survival games from Portal, Ignacity likes to remind us that he has no qualms in making everything very difficult for you. <laughs> These are exceptionally hard games to succeed at, particularly one of them, but they are wonderfully thematic. They, they just immerse you in the setting, they've got multiple scenarios, one even has a legacy style campaign. It's just, they're just really good to get your teeth into but they are quite complex and not for the everyday gamer. The first one is the super hard one, Robinson Crusoe. Oh yes, everybody who's played this knows how stupidly hard this one is. But the other one that I want to give some praise to is this one, First Martians. Now this one didn't get as much buzz as Robinson Crusoe. Granted, the app was a bit buggy to start with and the rule book was atrocious. It just was. But the rule book's been updated with an almanac, which is a lot easier to read. There's a Watch It Played video from, Rod from Rodney Smith, and uh, the app has had a lot of bug fixes and now works perfectly fine for me. So I do urge people to give this another try if you have a chance. But this one and Robinson Crusoe, they are so similar to each other, I just could not split them apart. But they're wonderful to play solo. You know, you can play this with two, three, or four players, and that's all well and good, but the more players you have, the longer it takes, you've got more discussion to go on, and it just gets a little bit unwieldy. Particularly, I think, with Robinson Crusoe, it just gets, like, insane with that many players. You know, I prefer to play Robinson Crusoe with a maximum of... Mm, occasionally, you might convince me to play free player, but I'd rather just one or two with this. And the same goes for First Martians. I've had a lot of fun with just one or two players here. But certainly, from a solo perspective, these games have been really solid. I mean, I can just play them, they're all set out, and then the game just throws all sorts of different problems at me, like, you know, uh, the tiger's coming to eat you, the rain's coming in, so all your, you know, have you got shelter, you know, in Mars, you know, oh, your oxygenator's broken down, you gotta fix it, or oh, you, you need to get out in that probe and go find something on the Mars service because, you know, my... PlayStation's not working or whatever, you know. It's, there's some great stuff it throws at you, and the fact that there's multiple scenarios means that the replay value of these is off the f***ing charts. You know, this one has now got something like seven or eight scenarios now, because I've got the six that were in the game. I've got King Kong as well, and I think there's another one I've just printed out recently with Poachers. It was a BGG promo. First Martians here has got you know a legacy style campaign. It's got some. It's got about six or seven, I think, you know, actual normal scenarios. And I printed off Epidemic, which I've actually yet to try. Actually, I need to try that at some point. You know, a disease-ridden scenario for the Mars one. Robinson Crusoe is literally like playing a survival Robinson Crusoe the board game, and First Martians is exactly like playing The Martian the board game, as in the uh, Matt Damon film, which is actually really good. Go check it out. I, I it was better than I thought it would be. So. I couldn't really split these games, but I love them both. They are fantastic, they are this close on my top 100, you know, they're just really cool. And playing them solo is an absolute joy. Number 8 goes to Robinson Crusoe and First Martians equally. My number 7 is the other solo only game on this list. You can only play it solo, there is no other way. This is a hard to find game though, and I apologize that if you live in the States or in the UK, you're gonna struggle particularly to find this game. However, hope is at hand. 
well, sort of. If you've got a lot of money, you can order direct from, um, I forget where it is, Korea or something, where or Japan, where the game is made. But if you're going to Essen this year, or no one, anyone who's going to Essen, I almost guarantee that the publisher who made this game, or at least a, a distributor for them, is going to be there. And they will more than likely have copies of this game if it's still in print. So you could ask someone you know to go bring one back. That would be a good tip for me. But this is a game with a weird theme that I just thought, why am I so interested in this? I don't even drink the stuff. This is just about brewing coffee. Really? That's a theme I'd latch onto, especially when I'm a tea drinker. But I gotta say, Coffee Roaster was a huge surprise for me. The first time I heard about it was when I think Eric Summer mentioned it on a Dice Tower live show at Essen. It's like, God, you're going really gaga for this coffee making game. All right, fine, let me go and have a look. Went over to the publisher stand. A lovely Lun Asian lady, you know, showed me the game. I went through and did a solo playthrough. I think I was wrapped up in about 20 minutes because I was learning the rules of the game. I was hooked, bought it instantly. This is a highly enjoyable yet simple bag building solo game. You are brewing coffee and you can do one on its own or three in a row. There are multiple different difficulties, but they have lots of different starting setups and lots of different requirements for what star rating, you know, how, how much do you want to roast this coffee? But the way this works is that you put a load of these tokens in the bag and you pull so many out as this turn counter moves, which is basically the coffee roasting machine. The longer you take though, the more tokens you pull out, but then the coffee machine gets hotter and hotter and hotter and the more smoke appears and these are tokens that go into your bag and clog it up. What you're trying to do is you're trying to have lots of these different beans from level zero to four and when they're on a lower level, if they survive to the end of a round, they level up. And what you're trying to do is get as many of these high beans as possible, or well, maybe not, it depends what coffee you're making, in order to say, right, I'm done roasting, let's brew this coffee. You then pull 10 tokens out of the bag, you fill up this mug, and you see what level you got your uh, roast rating at by adding up all the beans that you've got in it, as well as any other weird things you were going for, like flavors and maybe some negatives for certain bad tokens that you put out of the bag. But it's such, I don't know, it's, it's very well produced. I wish the insert could hold this game a lot better when I was storing it vertically, that's the only annoying thing. But, you know, it's good production, uh, high quality, and it's just a nice zen-like sort of feeling game, really, because it's not just simply, oh, I need beans, right, leave them out. No, you've got water tokens to deal with, you've got uh, burnt beans, you've got hard beans, which take a little bit extra to roast up. You might be going for extra points by getting the uh, flavor and acidity and aroma, you know, tokens on the coffee as well. And some of the coffees are just harder than others. You know, they give you less tokens to work with, but you have to make good use of these various special abilities that you can trigger, which allow you to like, you know, draw and redraw or trash tokens or, you know, stabilize the coffee for an extent or add more leeway for the final round, like pull out 12, 13 tokens instead of 12, you know, that kind of thing. And it's just a very nice, enjoyable, simple game. It takes no more than 10 to 30 minutes to play, and that's assuming you're doing one or three you know, different menus. So it's basically 10 minutes per coffee that you brew, particularly when you're used to the game. It's expensive, I know, unless you're going to Essen, but I highly recommend it. If you have a means to grab this game and you like solo games, you should definitely give this one a look. Number seven, Coffee Roaster. My number six is another meaty Euro, an Ure Rosenberg Euro, in fact. Now this one used to only be playable with one to two players. It can now be played with up to three, and I must admit, this would probably be higher on the list if it weren't for the expansion. Because the expansion making it free player with some of the rules it throws in means that I now really enjoy playing this with free player. But predominantly, I will still play this with just myself, you know, rather than even a two player, in fact. And this is one of my, uh, probably my favorite Uri Ro is it my favorite? Yeah, it is my favorite Uri Rosenberg game, I believe, in my top 100. You know, I like Caverna, it's great. I like other Uri Rosenberg games, they're great. But this one, Fields of Arl, the ultimate sandbox Euro game from Uri Rosenberg. This is pure sandbox, you know, uh, farm building. You have a sort of an area, and I believe like North Germany area, 
and you've got the Dyke Coast, but you can do, you can farm wheat, you can farm uh, uh, reeds, you know, I think it's weed, you know, like a different plant for clothing in that. You can raise animals, you can push the dike barriers back and expand your field, you can get properties, you can upgrade your tools, you can, you know, do, well, in terms of animals, you've got sheep, you've got cows, you've got, <laughs> you know, and everything you can think of, you can do in this game. It's such a glorious sandbox game to play. And the recent expansion, Tea and Trade, like I say, has made it more enjoyable for me with three players now, but it's added some extra cool stuff in the game, like the tea tokens that allow you to do cool stuff in your turn, like double the potency of your action or just increase the, um, you know, the, the value of your tools. And essentially, you are doing what you do in a lot of early Rosenberg games. You're building up your little farm or you know, your little settlement, village, whatever you want to call it, and you basically try and get victory points. But this is a big point salad, and as a one-player game, it's a great one to just say, you know what, I just feel like building a farm. I don't care about good versus evil, I don't care about whether I've beaten someone on victory points or even done so well myself for victory points. I just feel like building a farm and trying something different because there's so many paths to victory in this game, it's unreal. So I can just say, you know what, I feel like doing mass clothing this round, fine. I am going to build up my farm in such a way that I am just getting leather and wool and you know cotton coats or whatever they are and just going with that. Fine. Next game, I decide I'm going to do a ton of animal rearing, so I try and get animals all over my park. Uh, next game, I decide I'm just going to dehydrate my moors, expand it all the way out to the edge, and fill it up with wheat. You know, I can literally decide what I want to do every game, and I love, 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 love sandbox-style games. Not all of them. I mean, some of them can go on too long and be overly complex, but this is you know, the idea that I can pick my own path do what I want to do, and if it doesn't win me the game, so what? I had fun doing my choice, not having the game dictate it to me. I hate it when the game dictates things to me like that. So, Fields of Arl, free player, is still really good fun. And I still enjoy it with two. But I really get a kick at playing this one solo. And certainly before this expansion came out, I was predominantly doing this solo. Fantastic sandbox Euro game, Fields of Arl, number six. My number five is a game that you probably thought was going to be my number one, but I'm sorry I can't have you know the entire box on my lap right now as I'm talking to you. This is the game that you figured would be my number one, it's my number one game of all time, and it is the perfect superhero co-op game that there is, and that is Sentinels of the Multiverse. The reason I don't want to grab it is because it's in a giant collector's box on top of my Kallax in the other room, and I just don't feel like going and grabbing it and holding it in my hand like a child, or sorry, as I'm trying to explain things to you. If you want to check out my recent review for Oblivion, the expansion, and the collector's case itself, go check out my recent review. But otherwise, you know, go watch my uh, 10 through 1 of my top 100, and I'll explain it more then. Sentinels in the Multiverse is what I really want in a superhero game, because I love superheroes. It's my favorite theme. I watch loads of TV shows and movies on the matter, Marvel, DC, whatever. Love them both. And, well, okay, Marvel a lot better than DC, but still. And with this one, with some of these superhero games, it's like, oh, like Marvel Legendary. You deck build, and spoiler alert, it's uh, uh, Marvel Legendary it was a shortlisted one, but it didn't make my top 10. But with that one, you're deck building from a pool of cards. So you end up with this mishmash of heroes. This one, you are this hero. I want to be expatriate. Good. Here's your deck. Here's your character, your special ability, your unique deck. Go. And with solo mode, I just pilot three decks, you know, I choose three of my favorite heroes or try a combo I've never done before, put them together, choose a villain, an environment, and go at it. With the Oblivion scenario, I can get through that and do like the most epic Infinity War style like game that I've ever played of Sentinels, although it has a lot of bookkeeping and it takes me a long time, so there is that caveat. But even just getting the game out, and it's not even including the app. The app for the Sentinels Multiverse is fantastic, but I'm not even including an app in this. I will happily take the physical game, get free heroes, environment, villain, and go. And I will have a great time doing it. The replay value with the, all the stuff I've got, everything from start to finish, is off the charts. I've got variants for all the heroes, loads of environments, all the villains, all the heroes, all the variants. It's just a fantastic co-op game. I love it so much. So why is it not number one on this list? Well, as much as I like playing it solo, 
I do really get a kick out of playing it multiplayer as well. You know, I like to be able to show new people what I keep raving about this game so much and let them make their own decision as to whether they enjoy it or not. But there are friends of mine who really enjoy this game as well. And with them, I like to just play the game and we can have a, you know, big, we can like ham it up, you know, do silly voices for our heroes or really go, you know, typical cheesy 90s superhero style with catchphrases and that. But we get into the theme and it's just fun to have like two or three mates who are into superheroes really get immersed and enjoy the game. And as a co-op, it really does teach teamwork because you cannot be a lone ranger in this game. You might be doing really like huge amounts of damage, like punching the villain like constantly. But if you haven't got the healing from the other bloke, or the support from that person, or the backup from the other one, you're not going to do so well. So it's just such a fun co-op. I play it with multiplayer, and I enjoy it. But as a solo game, <laughs> you know, just being able to pull out some decks, I've got to the point now where I can handle all the admin and bookkeeping, pilot all free, and I have a whale of a time. Sentinels in the Multiverse, my number one game, but only number five on this solo list. So what possibly overtook it? My number four is one that, again, I can't really get the uh, box for you because it is in that giant legendary vault. Yes, I mentioned Marvel Legendary didn't make my uh, top ten, but one of the legendaries did. This is my personal favourite legendary game to play, and the easiest one to showcase this is simply... Well, I was going to show a... Uh, actually, yeah, <laughs> let me just show you this little clip. away from her you bitch god that moment is so kick-ass isn't it anyway it is legendary encounters alien and the best way to sort of showcase it is just by uh, having the playmat yes the original playmat for legendary encounters which plays very much like the marvel version except that there's a few key differences cards come out of the encounter deck face down which is very fitting for the alien theme because you don't know where the aliens are or what's there so you've got to scan them first you have all the iconic characters from the films you have the four films as the scenarios and with the expansion you can play as the queen as a, a, a you know a, a player against the others and you have two other custom scenarios which are unique you know they're not they're based maybe on some alien lore but they're not based on movies so six scenarios and the ability to just interchange all the objectives willy-nilly but wow with this one it's so much fun playing it solo and typically i can play it solo with just one deck or typically I will pilot it with two decks. I will put two decks there, build each one of them and go at it. Because when you've got a lot of players in the legendary games, you're kind of asking to lose really. You know, four or five players in something like Marvel Legendary and you will pretty much lose nearly every game because there's just too many players, too many villain cards coming out and not enough time for people to build up. Although Legendary Encounters Alien does have a way of combating that in its rules, but that's a side thing. But three players is fine, two players I really enjoy, but it's sometimes easier for me to just grab this game from the vault, especially as it's a huge box, and just play out two decks in solo mode. With Alien Legendary, you can still use the coordinate keyword, which allows you to give cards to other players. Granted, if I'm piloting two decks, one can coordinate with the other, so I can do a little bit of shenanigans with that. But just, I love the Alien universe. Granted, the films have kind of steamrolled over it since uh, the second Alien film, unfortunately. I can just about watch the director's cut of Alien 3, but Resurrection onwards, oh my, that, <laughs> absolute rubbish. But you can't get a better horror film than the original Alien, you can't get a better action horror film than Aliens, and you can't get a better horror-themed computer game than Alien Isolation. Oh yes, the Alien universe is one that I do like a lot. And this is one of the most thematic deck builders I've ever played. With this, you know, you've got chest bursting as a potential way to die. You know, one of the best ways you can die in any deck build or any game, to be honest. The fact that you can get a chest burster and die instantly. The tension as that ramps up and you know it's in your deck and it's going to come out, it's going to come out, it's going to go out, and instantly. But with one player, it's so easy for me to just say, look, I feel like these two avatars, they work together nicely. Um, I'd like to have this combo of characters. Typically, what I like to do is I like to play the movies as per the movie. So if I'm playing, let's say, Aliens, then that means my characters I choose are going to be people like Hicks and Hudson and... Um, oh my god, why am I brain on that one? Uh, Bishop, you know, and something else. It's been a while since I've watched the Aliens movie. I should go watch it, actually. But, yeah, it, you know, I can have the iconic characters and obviously Ripley, for example. So, 
you know, it just, it's an easy one for me to pull out solo than it is for me to pull out multiplayer. Particularly as I can't carry this huge box to a game night really anymore. So most of the legendary games are only played solo now by myself. Unless I invite people around, in which case we can play it then. But out of all the legendary games, and they all made my shortlist, I like Marvel, you know, I love Marvel, I like the Predator, and I kind of like the Serenity uh, Firefly one as well. But you just can't beat Aliens. Love it. Alien Legendary number four. Game over, man. It's game over. My number three is an LCG. LCG formats I really like. Now, in some respects. They were good with the competitive side, but with competitive games you tended to, you know, if you didn't keep up with it fast enough, then you got left behind and all the expert players looked down on you for not having the right cards. You know, the community for some of those uh, competitive LCGs is a little bit ho-hum, really. But I still enjoyed them. The co-op ones, though, ah, oh, they are great. And this one is a recent LCG in the co-op genre that basically you know, takes the like the Cthulhu universe and makes a really good immersive and highly narrative storyline with it. Of course, you know what it is. I don't really, I'm not getting the whole box down, but I'll at least get the folders. Yeah, Arkham Horror, the living card game. Investigators, player cards, and all the encounter cards and a big wooden box up there. But this is still loads of fun to play. You know, I'm, I'm worried like halfway through the, more than halfway through the Forgotten Age cycle now, cycle three. It's been going strong. I've enjoyed it ever since it started coming out. And I have very rarely played this with more than just myself. You know, I tried a four player campaign of it. We actually went through the entire Dunwich saga in one day. We did it as a 24 hour thing. Whew, it uh, took a while and it was quite brain burning, but when I played it, I thought, okay, four player is fine, but I'd rather only play it two players max. I think two players is the maximum I ever want to play this game with. But even then, that's super rare. I have played this game predominantly solo only. And I mean, I've got more to play it than it is. You know, this is the the deck for uh, City of Archives, I think it's called. Uh, yeah, City of Archives. So the newest mythos pack you know i've got the instruction sheet here from the from the pack i've unwrapped it i just haven't had a chance to sort out the cards yet but uh if i get time tonight i might roll through that scenario because i've heard really good things but it's such a good narrative storyline you know theme in a card game is a hard thing to represent but here everything that you've got whether it's your personal investigator with their various cards feels thematic it ties into the arkham horror lore but the storylines that develop through the campaigns are fantastic. During the quest, well, I say quest, during a scenario or after a scenario in between like the one you're doing and the next one, you have to make choices, story-based choices. Like, do you follow so-and-so character or do you get too suspicious and deny her help? And then later on, you get to another campaign or another storyline um, scenario and then the repercussions of your decision come back in a positive or a negative way. And it's just such a great thing. You know, you've got a log that you update like the various keywords that you found or the various decision choices that you've made. You record like your assets, your physical trauma, mental trauma, and you can, the campaign can end in lots of different ways. There's different resolutions to every scenario, different outcomes of the campaign, depending on how well you do in the last one. And all the investigators, I mean, there's so many now, I mean, Skids, Agnes, Wendy, Daisy, Jim, Roland, Rex, uh, Matteo, Yorick, uh, Kashi, Finn, Minty Pan, I can't pronounce your name, Calvin, Wright, Leo Anderson, Lola, Jenny Barnes, uh, Zoe, uh, is that all of them? Ash can Pete, his dog. There's so many of them now, and I don't even own all of them. Lucky you people in America, you get to go to Arkham Horror Nights and get all these promo investigators and get the books and stuff, and ugh, I hate you. <laughs> so I want to get, I want these uh, organized FFG events in Britain, and we just don't get them. So I don't get to have all these cool, like, Arkham Horror Nights. You know, I want them in the UK, <sighs> if only. But even without that, Solo, I get to play this game a lot. You know, as a new pack comes out, it's like, oh, I get the pack, I get new cards. Yes, let's play for the scenario, I wanna do it. And then when it's done, I think, oh, come on, I wanna wait for the next scenario. But then I could just go back and grab the uh, the other scenarios and play through with a different investigator. I've even done two-handed at times, but typically I like to just play one deck. And, you know, they're, they're now bringing out these uh, 
kind of updates to the encounter cards. It's not the most cost effective thing, I must admit, because they give you a storage box. Yes, but I've got a giant wooden storage box up there and two folders. I don't really need extra storage boxes and pay the money for them. But the idea of improving some of the earlier quests with new cards and new variety is tempting. So maybe I will start investing in them when the Dumb Witch one comes out. I mean, I have to get Return to Night of the Zealot or whatever it is. But maybe I'll start investing in them just to get the cards. You know, it's more player cards, more encounter cards. It's just the box might go to waste. I have to find a use for it. But like I say, I digress. Arkham Horror, the living card game. My number three solo game. Predominantly, like 98% played solo. I love it. And most people out there do as well. It's a solid game with a great community. My number two game is... Uh, getting a bit of a stern look for me because I've just spent a lot of money, my own personal money, on acquiring a new case for it. The case is currently being built by Op Laser and it's going to be an antique case. I could get them for some of the LCGs but this antique case is going to look like a kind of leather bound briefcase and it's finally going to store this particular game for me which is a bit of a beast to store particularly when all the miniatures go into bags and the tiles are like so much in number that it's hard to organize them all. This will allow me to organize my collection of this game finally but it's uh, cost me a pretty penny I paid the extra to get the antique version and also so that I don't have to build it so, uh, so I, as much as I like inserts it's annoying having to spend the time to build them this however is a game that I have played solo all the time except I think twice <laughs> where I've played it with other players it can take far too long with other players though and I would rather just beam the uh, the app which is fantastic to my TV screen there have the soundbar play the audio for ambience and just set it up and go through a scenario by myself maybe controlling free investigators yes we're still in the Cthulhu universe and it is the utterly fantastic Mansions of Madness. This is just one of the expansion boxes because I've got the other one in a big box there and it is a nightmare to store this at the moment and get it into an efficient manner. So I've invested in a briefcase uh, storage system for this from Uplaser and let's hope it's good. I won't see it for at least another four weeks, I think, but certainly you'll see pictures on my Instagram and Twitter and that when I get it. But whew, this game, you know, Mansions of Madness was okay. But it was easily broken, it was all over the place with the expansions, and it clearly needed a lot of work. But this one, the 2.0 version, is just amazing. Wonderfully thematic, wonderfully immersive. The app is the best integration of an app into any board game. Better than XCOM, better than even like the first Martians and all that lot. No, this is the best app. It creates ambi ambient sound, it gives you narrative descriptions of the combat moves you're doing and the storyline and all the horror events. It's not just simply you walked into a room, make a horror check. No, it's you walked into a room and this girl that you've not seen since she died when she was five years old approaches you in the room and suddenly her jaw drops and it goes black and turns into swimming fish. You know, it's like, you know, it becomes Slender Man. It's so wonderfully immersive and the app just handles the bookkeeping for you. It keeps track of various things and all you've got to do is set up the map tiles and move the little miniatures around to say where your investigators are and keep track of their items and that. There's loads of scenarios for this because the expansions, it's FFG, you know, big shock horror. <laughs> you know, they're pumping out expansions and pumping them out and pumping them out, which means more tiles, more monsters, but importantly, more scenarios. You can even download scenarios straight off the net, you know, a few quid. Think of it like an in-app purchase, and these are cool scenarios as well, but... There's so much content I've got in this because I've got every expansion, I've got the uh, the first edition conversion kits that gave me more scenarios. I haven't even played every scenario in this game yet and it's just, you know, it's hard to obviously find the time but every time I do get it out, oh yes, I love it. It is a wonderful game. That playing solo is just a dream, you know. It's late at night, you know, close the curtains, have the sound on and play a very spooky Cthulhu game. And to be honest, we're getting into October getting into Halloween. So uh, I think it's time to bring out this game a little bit more often as we approach Halloween. So Mansions of Madness 2.0, my second favorite solo game. So my number one solo game, yeah, you called it. You knew this one was coming. If you've paid attention to my top 10s and top 100s, you know that this game was coming. This game I have never played other than solo. I'm, I'm almost positive on that. 
At most, maybe I got taught it as a two player, I'm not sure. But even then, I think I bought it and played it solo. You know, I can't remember any time I've played this other than solo. This is my favorite LCG. It's hard to decide between this and the Arkham Horror one that I did before, but wow, I love the IP this is based on. I love the variety in the quests. I love all the encounter cards. I love all the different types of decks I can make. When I play this game, I put the playmat out, which is ho-hum. I might get a different playmat, one that's less about having functional areas and just one that has a cool map or something. Uh, and this is another one of those occasions where everybody in the States is on fellowship events and it's like, I want to go to a fellowship event and I can't because it's all in the States and it's not in Britain. But, you know, all the stuff I'm missing out, even the collector's edition that Fantasy Flight did for this game and I can't get it because I'm here. It's like, not fair. <laughs> Maybe I should move to the States. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've got too much to do here. I can't move to the States, but I need to visit it more often, I think. But this is my LCG of choice. It is the wonderful... Yeah, Lord of the Rings LCG, you called it, it's the LCG that I rave on about a loads, I've only played it solo, it's in another wooden box up there which is actually starting to get to a full point, I might need to invest in something for that, maybe get an antique case for that one, oh we've got money, but um, you know this one, you know, the two folders I've got here holding loads of different player cards, you know, all these different player cards that I can use, and I've just been going through lots of scenarios uh, for this game, like in rapid succession, because I'm behind. I, you know, I haven't done every scenario because there was just so much content when I started getting into it, and it's finding the time to do it. But in the quests, I love all the encounter cards. I love all the different types of decks I can make. When I play this game, I put the playmat out, which is ho oh, hum. I might get a different playmat, one that's less about having functional areas and just one that has a cool map or something. Uh, and this is another one of those occasions where everybody in the States is on fellowship events and it's like, I want to go to a fellowship event and I can't because it's all in the States and it's not in Britain. But, you know, all the stuff I'm missing out, even the collector's edition that Fantasy Flight did for this game and I can't get it because I'm here. It's like, not fair. <laughs> Maybe I should move to the States. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've got too much to do here. I can't move to the States, but I need to visit it more often, I think. But this is my LCG of choice. It is the wonderful... Yeah, Lord of the Rings LCG, you called it, it's the LCG that I rave on about a loads, I've only played it solo, it's in another wooden box up there which is actually starting to get to a full point, I might need to invest in something for that, maybe get an antique case for that one, oh we've got money, but um, you know this one, you know, the two folders I've got here holding loads of different player cards, you know all these different player cards that I can use, and I've just been going through lots of scenarios uh, for this game, like in rapid succession, because I'm behind. I, you know, I haven't done every scenario because there was just so much content when I started getting into it, and it's finding the time to do it. But I've just completed the Harrod cycle, which is all about the uh, deserts and that. And I'm working through the new Rovanian, is it Rovanian uh, Dale quest, which are really good so far. Really loving this new cycle we're on, both in player cards and encounters. They're really good. FFG seem to have slowed down uh, their output speed with this, which is a bit of a shame because it's like, come on, I've been waiting ages just to get the second pack in this cycle. It's taking forever. Stop announcing new packs and just give us the packs that I want now. So they're a bit slow with this, which is a bit annoying, but I've got so much content to get through. What does it matter? This game just gives me Lord of the Rings in a card game. I will put the app on the screen and I will listen to the soundtrack of the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy as I play this game. It's so immersive to be going through a quest where say, you know, like one of my biggest fears or something, you know, I'd be going under the desert sands to rescue my friends that have been captured by giant spiders to go kill the queen. And all the while that TV screen there is playing the Bridge of khazad music or something or Shelob attacks and that. And I mean, I love the Lord of the Rings movies. I love the, I like the Hobbit movies as well. Not as much as Lord of the Rings, but still. I love the soundtrack. I, love the, I just love a lot of stuff about Lord of the Rings. So an LCG based on it that is solo and cooperative is just amazing. And not to say I won't play it two player ever. I don't want to play it four really, but two player I would play this with. But because it's a co-op thing, um, a Nyrim solo game from the Omniverse universe, really good. Uh, Feast for Odin, it's got an interesting solo mode, but I usually prefer to play this with a couple of players really. Uh, Caverna, plays well solo, but again, I prefer the multiplayer aspect. 
Uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, this would probably be an 11, 12, 13, you know, I can play that one, you know, really easily. Uh, the New Detective by uh, Portal, um, the one behind me just there, you know, I can play it with other players fine, but I really enjoy playing it solo as well, so that was uh, quite high up. Uh, Pursuit of Happiness, Anachrony, Valley of the Kings has got a nice little solo mode. Friday, another solo only card game, really cool. Scythe, Scythe and Viticulture would probably be a bit lower on the list. I'm not a fan of the way the Automna works in those games, so those didn't really rank that highly. Gaia Project, it's got a good solo mode, but it's quite fiddly. There's a lot of rules to comprehend at any one time in Gaia Project, and some of those enemies you fight in the solo mode are just ridiculously hard, but I'm not exactly a Gaia Project expert, that's probably why. Uh, Otis even has a solo mode, which I've, um, you know, I, I will hopefully do that as a solo walkthrough at some point uh, to showcase what it's like. Uh, XCOM, you know, solo mode, oh my god, is as tense as all get out when you play that one with all four stations by itself. Eldritch Horror, yeah, it's good to play that one solo, play with free investigators. And that's it for the short list. Yep, so there was quite a lot of games that I still enjoy playing solo. And like I say, as much as I love playing games with other people and socializing, running a games club of all things, and teaching games at dice events and stuff, I do like to just chuck out a game I enjoy, play for it solo, and have a good time with a cider or a cup of tea on, you know, a cold, well, a hot or cold, you know, weekday evening or even on the weekend. You know, it's, you know, we're coming up to Halloween. I mentioned I'll get Mansions of Madness out. I've been playing a lot of Lord of the Rings LCG lately. Um, I've got a scenario just there for Arkham Horror. I'll probably play that tonight even. So, there's a lot to be said about solo gaming. I, you know, whether, if you don't like it, fine. But don't, you know, don't look down on it. A lot of people like to play games solo. The fact that I'm even going to do solo walkthroughs in the future is testament to the fact that the main reason I'm doing it, as much as I will enjoy doing the videos, is because the feedback that I got when I asked about it on the FAQ was just overwhelming. Like, I think everybody who commented on the solo walkthrough said, we want to see it great. So... That many people who like comment on my videos want to see solo walkthroughs means that solo gaming is here to stay. It is very popular and more publishers need to start putting solo modes in their games if possible because they are very popular. In fact, there are some games I don't actually enjoy that much that I might play solo. Terraforming Mars is a good example. Not the biggest fan of that game, it's a bit overrated for me, but the most fun I ever had with Terraforming Mars is when I played it solo. So, uh, you know, It'll be pretty sweet to get the app when that's out and play through that solo, maybe. So, you know, there are solo mode can help games in such a way. But before I wrap up the show, I can't forget my Patreon supporters. Yes, this is the top 10, so therefore, what's the Patreon choice for solo games? It's an odd one. The best suggestion I got given when I asked my Patreon crowd was the Manhattan Project Energy Empire. That was an unusual one. It's got a solo mode in it, and it's, it's decent, but it's not much different from the actual two-player game in this. You have neutral workers that block spaces, you're restricted on certain how many structures are there, and basically what you're doing is you're trying to complete three objectives. Get all the way up the United Nations track, have a certain amount of points from achievements, that kind of thing, and get at least 100 victory points or something like that. And then it ranks you based on how far you get beyond that. Aside from that, it just basically tweaks a few rules where when it references other players, it has a slight variation because obviously you're playing by yourself. But kind of odd this one. I mean, you can play it solo and it will take you about an hour, an hour to do. And it's a decent enough solo mode, so I'm glad it's in here. But I'll admit, I, this didn't even come to my mind when I was thinking of my shortlist. I, I know it has a solo mode, but it just never popped into my head. You know, I've only played it, I think, once or twice, and like I said, it's, it's decent. I mainly used it as a rules teaching tool, just to get over the basics of the game. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a decent solo mode. I don't think it's bad. I just didn't, it didn't blow my mind either as being, like, really, really good. But Energy Empire as a game is really, really good. And I think the main reason that <clears throat> this one didn't pop to my head as much is because with Energy Empire, I prefer to play this with more players. Not necessarily, like, the full count, but... I want that interaction with everybody, like, nicking the dice you want, nicking the spaces you want, the timing of when people's workers come off on the board. That that interplay is so much more varied and, you know, profound when you have multiplayer games of this rather than solo. So, yeah, it's a cool game. I like it, and the solo mode works, but it's not the first one I would pick myself. But 
That's what the Patreons say, so kudos to them. So enough rabbiting from me anyway, it's time for me to get on with some dinner and some more videos. So, regardless of whether you want to play with other people or you just want to sit in your back cave and play a game solo, remember to come out at the end of the day and, you know, be social with all your friends and family because, you know, at the end of the day, they're the most important thing. So remember, it's only a game, and I'll see you on the next Top 10 video, which will be the Top 10 games that I love but spent way too much money on. See you soon, and take care.